Andrew Collins woke up on February 8, 2006, determined to make a drug bust. He was a narcotics cop, trying to make a name for himself. Jamel McGee headed to the grocery store that morning and had no idea he wouldn't see his infant son for three more years. Andrew set his sights on Jamel as he walked into the store, then falsely accused Jamel of possessing crack cocaine. Jamel spent three years in a federal prison as an innocent man, hoping to one day get revenge. But two years later, after an investigation for falsifying police reports, Andrew also went to prison. In their book, Convicted, Jamel and Andrew share how their paths crossed as free men and why Jamel chose to pursue forgiveness and reconciliation for themselves, their community, and our racially divided country. Well, joining me now is Andrew Collins and Jamil McGee, and it's an honor to have you both. Thanks this, for having us. You have quite a story of, of forgiveness, and it's an, it's a, I, I just think it's a really unlikely one, um, where, Jamel, I, you know, I read your story, and, and I'm just amazed that you can sit here with the guy that put you in jail <laughs> uh, and did so wrongly. You, you, you didn't have any drugs on you, and you essentially get framed. Yes. Um, by the by, the police who are trying or supposed to be protecting you. Yes. You get you get framed. Yes. Um, so, how did you forgive? Hmm. Yes. Well, I allow God in. <laughs> I allow God in my life. Hmm. Um, and essentially, I knew I had a son, um, my child, and I didn't want him to value my past and recreate it into his own. So um, I knew I had to let this go. You know, God is telling me to let it go. I need to let it go. And it, ultimately, it was hurting me more than anybody. Um, I think that's a strong message that, yeah, that just that phrase, I need to let it go because it was hurting me. A lot of people that hold anger and, uh, and hold resentment never, never get to that point. Uh, it just becomes them. It becomes them. And how did you see that? How did you see this isn't what I wanted, want to be? <clears throat> because it was, <laughs> it was leading me down the same roads I've always been. And I, I just didn't want to continue that. And I didn't, I didn't want that life of my son. You know, I want, and for, uh, and for other kids that look like my son, like I didn't, I want, some, I want them to do something different than I did. I didn't want them to make the same mistakes that Jamel did. Um, and in that I didn't have the same, you know, I didn't have that positive role model to say, hey, no, don't do that, do something different. I want to get that to my son and other kids um, like him. Okay. Well, Andrew, let's, let's talk your journey. Yeah. Here you are, police, you're sort of the expert at drug bust, you, you, that's your identity, that's your ego. Um, and you go from that to being caught yeah. for a lot of bad things, not yeah. just uh, framing people, but uh, a lot of bad things. Yeah. And then you have to come to grips with who you are. Right. W what happened with you? Yes, I mean, I started police work because I wanted to save lives. I wanted to bring peace into people's lives. I grew up in a house of domestic violence, and one day a police officer was called, and he brought peace into my home, not because he was mean or aggressive, just because of his presence. So from that point on, I just wanted to be a police officer. And I started with really good intentions, and I was a really good police officer before I was a really bad police officer. And it started with small integrity slips. It, you know, I don't think anybody wakes up one day and says, I'm going to steal a million dollars. I think they start by stealing ten and then they see they get away with it. And then you know, that slow fade leads to what becomes your identity. And by the end of my career, I was a full-blown corrupt police officer, stealing money from people, stealing money from the city that I worked for, planting drugs and crime scenes. And that, that all came to a head one day in February of 2008, where I was caught with crack, heroin, and marijuana in my office. And that led to a crisis of faith. I had come to, come to Jesus when I was seven as my savior. Uh, you can be the savior in my life. Thank you for dying for my sins. But lordship, uh, that's my role. I'll take yeah. that. And that's how I lived my life up until 25. And I found myself sitting in a pastor's office crying my eyes out because my life had crumbled. My, my career was gone. My friends were gone. My wife was confused. I had just got caught with drugs. You know, well, what is this all about? 
And that's when I really turned to Jesus as not only the Savior of my life, but the Lord of my life. And it's been a, a nine-year love affair chasing after him, seeing what that looks like. <laughs> I think you said something remarkably key, that you start, it started off with something small. Yeah. And then you, you think you get away with it. Yeah. But then that uh, it triggers, well, I can do that again, and I can do that again. Yeah. Uh, and ultimately, you get to be a slave of it. And it really doesn't matter what it is. Uh, you're now slave to it, and, and you can't break out. And as you'll read in the book, there were so many times in my career where I took a stance and said, no more, not doing this anymore. And then the very same day, I'd have a temptation come across my plate. I'd lift a mattress, and there's thousands of dollars under the mattress, and I'm the only one in the room. You know, I, you know, I would say I'm not going to do this anymore, but there was an enemy that wanted to offer up temptation over and over, and I was just so far deep in my pit, I couldn't pull myself out. Do you think what happened to you was, was God actually orchestrating it yeah. for your benefit to say, I want you, yeah. you know, I'd and, people, Andrew, you mind? I had had people in prison tell me, oh, when you were born, God knew you were coming to prison. I said, he might have known it, but I don't think that was my mission on earth, you know. But he can use all of our bad, all of our messes and use them for his good. And I think that's what happened in my story was, there, now that I look back, there was plenty of times where I had inclinations that I needed to stop. There was times that I tried to stop, and God finally said, enough is enough. I'm not going to let you hurt yourself anymore, and I'm not going to let you hurt any more people. And just through his grace, he allowed me to fall at that point in history, because if I'd have kept going, it would have been a longer prison sentence, or I'd have been dead. I have no doubt about it. All right, well, let's, let's fast forward. Yeah. You go to jail. You go to jail. <laughs> you both get out, yeah. and then you meet. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and that could have been an explosive situation. <laughs> and it turned out to not be one. Yeah. Why? <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> God, man. Uh, God. Um, it could. It could have. It could have very well been that explosive situation, but um, God intervened, and He wanted something different. He had a different plan um, for the both of us, even though we couldn't see it then, and in those moments. But God was already formed a plan. And he just wanted us to follow it, and then ultimately, I followed that plan. That's right. Well, let's get let's get to the ultimately, because I think, I think at that meeting you left Andrew with an emotional memory. It, was, yes. it wasn't it wasn't a physical yeah. encounter, <laughs> but you left him with an emotional memory. And uh, how how did you, how did you two become friends? Yeah, so uh, I was working at a nonprofit, the Mosaic CCDA in Benton Harbor, and Jamel was part of the uh, Jobs for Life program. And one day the uh, director said, hey, I think that God has laid it on my heart that you should mentor Zuki. Do you know Zuki? And I said, I don't think I know him. Uh, this is Zuki, by the way. Uh, this is a name that his grandma gave him when he was a little guy. And uh, so she goes across the street to the class and, and talks to Jamel about it and has said, this conversation. Hey, Jamel, we finally got your mentor. Um, we understand that he may have done some things in the city of Ben Harbor. Um, we can change him at any time you want uh, and get you somebody else if you don't want to get him. And I was like, all right, Miss P, enough. Who is it already? And she was like, Andrew Collins. And I was like, no way. There's no way. <laughs> There's no way. And, so so yeah. then he ends up coming across, has this, this God moment where God tells him to walk through it. And then we met at the cafe. And when I realized who he was, I started apologizing again. I felt like God had given me a second chance to apologize. And he was waving me off like, it's all good. It's forgiven. It's over. Mm -hmm. And then I, I said, can, can we do this mentor-mentee thing? And he said, I think God wants us to. And I said, can we pray? So we prayed together that God would bless our friendship. And that was in fall of 2015. And then in the spring of 16, we had been working together uh, all that time in the cafe, getting to know each other and journeying together. And then, uh, you know, CBS picked up the story and, and God has been opening platforms to share about his grace and reconciliation. Uh, I think you two have a story that really fits what's going on in America today, uh, both the injustice and then how do you get through that injustice to reconciliation and to a point of friendship, a bond that transcends everything that's happened between you. Uh, I, I just think it's absolutely incredible. Um, do you feel that way? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I do. I definitely think I do, because I'm hopeful that this, this type of demonstration will show others that it's possible. It can be done. You can get through it. 
Um, and in that, like, God will use whatever your brokenness, your hurtness, he will use it for the good if you allow. Amen. What would you say to somebody is the first step? Letting go. Letting, letting go of the reins. Let go of the control of it. Let God control it. Amen. Yeah. And I would say there's so many us, us versus them scenarios in our world right now. It's easy to slap my bumper sticker on something and say, this is what I believe, and I don't care what you believe. Yeah. And where it starts is we got to get together and, and with friendly conversation, talk about our differences. Why, when did we lose the art to have a good conversation and debate each other and walk away still friends? When did we lose yeah. that ability? It's like it's easier to be angry about it than it is to say, let's, we got to work this through. Yeah. Work this you know, through. We gotta, we're all in this together yeah. and we need to be one nation under God. Yay. That's it. All right, we can talk a long time, but they're <laughs> wrapping me. So if you want to hear more of their story, they have a book. It's called Convicted, and it's available in stores nationwide. And thank you both for being here. It's a great Thanks. story. Thank, thank you so you. much.